right, folks, if we can uh, get started, I'm going to stand this way so we get everything on the mic here. Good evening and welcome to this very important ceremony. Uh, my name is Scott Cunley and I'm very honored to be your first selectman. Uh, congratulations to all those elected and thank you to all the families that have supported each one of us along the way. If we could give the family. <laughs> Public service is a calling, and in this town, it's one performed by volunteers. The many meetings, long hours, and constant communications are just part of the dedication the folks who serve are willing to do for the betterment of Granby. We owe you all a debt of gratitude and our sincere thanks. Tonight, it is my honor to swear you all in so that you can begin your journey in using your skills and experience to work with your elected colleagues. Neighbors and friends had put their, have put their trust in us and we must do all that we can to live up to that honor. As a matter of procedure, the town manager will swear me in and then I will proceed to swear in each person by the board, by board and committees. As I announce your board, please step up to the front to receive the oath of office. Again, thank you all for coming and please give the outstanding volunteers and new elected officials a round of applause. How about right here? <laughs> okay, I would ask you to repeat after me. I, I, B. Scott Conley, B. Scott Conley, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully discharge according to the Constitution of the United States of America. I'm glad I have it written yeah. down. <laughs> that I will faithfully discharge according to the Constitution of the United States of America and the state of Connecticut and the state of Connecticut as well as the charter and ordinances of the town of Granby as well as the charter and ordinances of the town of Granby my duty <coughs> my duties as first selectman of, my, the, of the board of selectmen my duties as first selectman of the board of selectmen for the town of Granby Connecticut to, for the town of Granby, Connecticut. To the best of my abilities. To the best of my abilities. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you. So, do you have that list of all the, the, the list with all the boards in it? One second. So what we'll do is I'll call each board up and I'll swear you all in. Some boards are only one person. Um, so we'll go in an order. I'll swear everybody in. Just raise your right hand. I'm not sure if I'm going to have you repeat after me because you're not getting these copies. You do have to sign them. Um, but I'll say what I need to say and you say I do or so help me God. Uh, See, if we do this at night, maybe I should call it Cocktail with Cunley. You think? <laughs> Cocktails with Cunley? That sounds... No? It wouldn't go well. Town attorney won't approve that either. All right. <clears throat> so again, thank you to everybody for coming out. <clears throat> we'll see how fast John can run. Not so fast. Amongst yourselves. <laughs> if I had my own form, I would have been pretty sure they were one of the boards all right. I took Tappy for seven years when I was a little kid. You shall stop. That explains a lot. Oh, 
Um, just to let folks know, after we do the swearing in, there are some legal forms you have to sign. So after uh, we swear everybody in, we'll break before our meeting. People, please have coffee, water, whatever else is there, cookies. Um, and then we'll start our regular board of selectmen meeting right after that. All right? OK, that wasted a minute, so now <laughs> Big round of applause for this little thing. Cookies and everything. We're waiting for the town manager to get some lists. Got the papers. Let's go. No, it doesn't. There we go. All right. So John Adams is not here. Uh, zoning Board of Appeals alternate. Anybody? No? Yes? Alternate or just no? Alternate. Zoning Board of Appeals alternate. alternate. Just the alternate. We don't have. OK. Zoning Board of Appeals, and <laughs> I just want to wait until you sat down. I need to exercise. <laughs> OK. You could raise your right hand. <laughs> Do you solemnly swear that you will faithfully discharge according to the Constitution of the United States of America and the State of Connecticut, as well as the charter and ordinances of the Town of Granby, your duties as member of Zoning Board of Appeals for the Town of Granby, Connecticut, to the best of your abilities, so help you God. I do. Congratulations. Thank you. Planning and zoning alternate. This is Johnson. Don't smile so much. <laughs> Don't be happy. <laughs> okay, if you could raise your hand. Do you solemnly swear that you will faithfully discharge according to the Constitution of the United States of America and the state of Connecticut, as well as the charter and ordinances of the town of Granby, your duties? On the, as planning and zoning alternate for the town of Granby, Connecticut, to the best of your abilities, so help you God. I do. Congratulations. Planning and zoning commission. Okay. Okay. Oh, you. <laughs> you and Paul. That's it. How are you? Good. All right. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that you will faithfully discharge according to the Constitution of the United States of America and the state of Connecticut, as well as the charter and ordinances of the town of Granby, your duties as planning and zoning commission for the town of Granby, Connecticut, to the best of your abilities? So help you God. I do. Congratulations. Thank you. Where it all started for me, the Board of Assessment Appeals, Mr. Johnson. And believe me, that's a fun board. That's a fun board. Kind of. <laughs> you can raise your right hand, sir. I will indeed. Do you solemnly swear that you will faithfully discharge according to the Constitution of the United States of America and the state of Connecticut, as well as the charter and ordinances of the town of Granby, your duties as a member of the Board of Assessment Appeals for the town of Granby, Connecticut, to the best of your abilities, so help you God. I do. Congratulations. Thank you. your wife wife, not, not you, sorry. <laughs> the Board of Education. <clears throat> okay, if you could raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear that you will faithfully discharge according to the Constitution of the United States of America and the state of Connecticut as well as the charter and ordinances of the town of Granby, your duties as members of the Board of Selectmen, or ooh, Board of Education for the town of Granby, Connecticut, to the best of your abilities, so help you God. 
Thank I you. do. Congratulations. Three against one, I'm a little intimidated here. If you could raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear that you will faithfully discharge according to the Constitution of the United States of America and the state of Connecticut, as well as the charter and ordinances of the town of Granby, your duties as members of the Board of Finance for the town of Granby, Connecticut, to the best of your abilities, so help you God? I do. I do. Okay. Okay, that's not okay. Uh, Board of Selectmen, there's a lot of you here. Holy cow. Come on in, folks. Come on. I'm selling market. Oh, now it's four against one. If you could raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that you will faithfully discharge according to the Constitution of the United States of America and the state of Connecticut, as well as the charter and ordinances of the town of Granby, your duties as members of the Board of Selectmen for the town of Granby, Connecticut, to the best of your abilities, so help you God. I do. I do. Congratulations. So what we'll do, um, folks, we do have these sheets. So during this break, we're going to take a five-minute break to please help yourself to refreshments. You can stay for the Board of Selectmen meeting, or you can <laughs> nicely <laughs> leave. Um, but we do have stuff. And then folks who were sworn in, if you could uh, come up here and sign in, that would be appreciated. Good evening, folks, and welcome to the Board of Selectmen regular meeting for Monday, November 18th, as we do with all of our meetings. Uh, if you're able to, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, folks. At this point, we will open a public session. Is there any member of the general public that wishes to address the board at this time? Anything on the agenda, not on the agenda? Anything? OK. We will close public session and move on to approval of the meeting minutes for October 21st. Move that we approve the minutes of the meeting on October 21st. Second. Motion in a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention motion carries. Thank you. Moving on to unfinished uh, business, we have our budget summit and discussions. Uh, tonight we'll be doing department presentations from library services, community development, town clerk. Are we doing town clerk? She's no. sick. We will not be doing town clerk because unfortunately she is not. Uh, feeling well. Uh, Department of Collector of Revenue and Tax Assessor. So at this point, if uh, I'll turn it over to John and you can have folks come up. Briefly, thank you. Uh, it's a continuation of the request to hear from the departments prior to we enter the plus one budget session. Uh, you will hear from several departments tonight um, who will outline <coughs> not just the numbers, but the scope of the programs and the services they provide the public, just again, to enhance your knowledge of the operations and what they provide the citizens. So I believe uh, first is Ms. Amy McHugh, Director of Library Services. Amy, if you would approach the lectern. Before I start, I did uh, watch last week's or last the last one and noticed some people had a hand up, so I thought I'd play along. So, good evening. Uh, thank you. 
As John said, I'm Amy McHugh, the Director of Library Services in Granby, and I am happy to be here tonight to brag about your library. Uh, I oversee the two branches of our library, the main branch here at the Town Hall Complex and the FH Cossett branch in North Granby. I have the pleasure of working with three full-time and 15 part-time staff members that keep the library doors open to the public six days a week, most evenings until 8 p.m. Our mission is to support the intellectual freedom and the right of individuals to read, learn, and gather together in a safe, friendly, and welcoming environment. The library provides free access to diverse ideas, resources, and experiences, and strives to enhance the quality of life in our community by providing and encouraging lifelong learning through a variety of resources. And generally, people know how libraries support this mission, books, programming, and computers. And for the most part, they're right. We are about those things. Over the last year, my staff completed over 208,000 transactions, including checking out over 98,000 items, answering over 9,000 questions, and hosting nearly 7,000 people at our programs for all ages. But we're about more than that, too. Every week, an average of over 1,300 people come through our doors, looking for information, yes, but also to connect with others, to try something new, and to have somewhere to be that is safe and warm and accepting and doesn't charge admission. People read the newspapers, pay their bills on the internet, consult with other parents to get advice. They have meetings and study for exams. New Granby citizens stop by the library to get a library card and some tips on where to, where to get pizza. <laughs> New retirees come to learn more about what the town has to offer now that they finally have time to take full advantage. People who attend our programs gain insight and a sense of community as they, along with their neighbors, <clears throat> learn about everything from cowboys in the Old West to the latest early literacy strategies, from 3D printer pens to new seasonal recipes, from ham radios to knitting, from space exploration to the history of the town of Granby. I know that you've also heard me mention the technology and digital resources we offer, all of which showed an increase in use this, over the last year. Those are available to cardholders even without coming through our doors. E-books, e-audiobooks, and digital magazines, databases like Ancestry, Value Line, and Consumer Reports, which went live this morning, so if you want to look up on our website, you're welcome to. Um, but I also wanted you to know that we've made some great strides this year updating our in-house technology. At the main branch, we've recently updated our internet connection to be considerably faster. We've replaced our public computers with newer models and updated software, and we're planning on completing Cossett within the next few months. We were also able to purchase new printers, copiers, and scanners for public use. This last year, the library won an award from the Goodspeed Opera House for their display encouraging pet lovers to read with their furry friends, and we were able to hold a special program featuring the canine star of their production because of Wind dixie at Cossett Branch. We started a collaborative program guide in conjunction with the Parks and Recreation and Senior and Social Services Departments that I believe they mentioned at the last meeting, and we established online registration for our programs. Our email newsletter goes out to about 4,000 people each month, and our website is the second most viewed in town. Our summer reading program saw a huge increase in participation, about 78%, due to our collaboration with the schools and the introduction of a summer program for our adult patrons, generally generously supported by local businesses. Our Cosset imprint Cosset Branch has seen an increase in attendance, too, due to fantastic programming, including a popular evening story time that we began offering this past spring updated more patron-friendly hours, and a staff that is more integrated with the main branch, leading to better service at both locations. <laughs> Much of this success is made possible because, in addition to town funding, we have three generous friends organizations, all of which offered us support beyond the basic needs of the library to help provide programs, materials, furniture, and more for library patrons. In the last year, the Granby Library Association supported our efforts in creating new, less intrusive program space by purchasing chairs, the Friends of Cosset have applied for and received grant support for our Cosset branch, funding the upcoming needs assessment and leading the way toward a historic restoration project. The Friends of Granby Public Library have funded the majority of our programs held at the main branch and continue to fund a portion of our magazine collection. These groups only provide the extras, however, and we're seeing that there will be some challenges we'll be facing in the coming years that our friends won't be able to help us with, including the need for increased funding for our part-time staff members, as they are the heart of our excellent customer service and the minimum range minimum wage rates will be increasing due to the recently passed laws. Staffing is challenging in another way as well, with many of the staff members working to capacity and the library's needs changing to require more and more specialized skills such as programming, marketing, and technology expertise. 
In addition, technology, hardware, and software continue to advance at breathtaking speeds, and we're going to have to develop a technology budget plan to stay up to date with the community needs and expectations. Finally, we have two aging buildings that will require improvements ranging from replacing car carpeting and ceiling tiles to upgrades in HVAC and septic systems. In the coming year, I hope to increase the library's technology services through both in-person classes and online resources, all of which, will, will, which have proven to be in demand. We plan to continue to provide diverse programming for patrons of all ages and hope to secure additional sources of funding to further our, expand our offerings. We're working to update both of our facilities to better ne meet the needs of those coming to work, browse, and participate. And we plan to be creative in our use of town resources while pursuing grants in several areas to help meet those needs. As we look toward the future of libraries, we're excited to see that libraries in general, and the Granby Library specifically, continue to be the hearts of their communities, providing residents with a way to learn and grow together under a shared roof. Wow, thank you very thank you. much. Um, let me just ask the board if they have any questions. <clears throat> well, Do you see, um, what's, what's changing in uh, libraries going forward? Is it, are the demographics of your, Visitors, are they changing? Is it skewing older? Is it, how is it changing? What do you see? Um, we do see a lot of retirees coming through. We do see a lot of young children's or fam children or families with young children coming through. Um, but I think a lot of people forget that the online services are part of what we offer. And for those, we maybe don't see everybody who uses them coming through the doors on a daily or weekly basis. But all of our online sources, um, rose this past year in use and so we're seeing we're reaching i think still all ages just in different ways than maybe the traditional ones that people think of uh, not not to say that people are not checking out their books because believe me we see we see our, our folks of all ages coming in every week to make sure they're up to date and, and what about the hours uh, that's always a very sens sensitive uh, topic are mm -hmm. people pressing for more hours um you know, it depends on the day, on the week, on the month. If, I mean, today someone came in and said, I stopped by on Friday at 3.30 and you weren't there. And I said, well, no, because we close at 2 on Fridays. And they were shocked and appalled. Um, but at the same note, we have other, we have whole sections of hours some evenings where nobody comes in. So it kind of depends yeah. on, on the day, on the weather, on the, uh, sure. um, we hear both. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. And yeah. from Simsbury, too. We do hear from Simsbury. We do hear from uh, Heartland. We yeah. hear from yeah. East Granby, and they all have their thoughts mm. on how we need to be open 24-7 yeah. um, in order to serve everybody. Right, right. Yep. I, I think Ed, Ed stole one of my questions, certainly in my mind, about how you're seeing the demographics change. We know how they're changing locally, regionally, and nationally. Mm -hmm. I think it shows up here, too, in the movement to online is one of the major trends and that's a great multiplier because we take out books all weekend right. and never show up at your door yep. through library connection that was a great advent but the second major trend that i've seen or is written about in research in libraries is um the use of cooperative space or collaborative space mm -hmm. right for people to get together around a topic or around a piece of work are you seeing that in our libraries so Informally, um, we do see people using our tables and chairs on a regular basis. We have two meeting rooms that people can reserve, and they are used on a more than daily basis by multiple groups to meet for whatever reason they choose to meet. Um, our only restrictions are if there's already somebody in there, you're out of luck. So we do welcome people to come in and use the library for whatever they need. Um, formally, we do have a number of programs that invite people to do just that. Um, to come and discuss and learn and talk and, and explore together, um, including a number of really neat teen and children's programs that allow the, um, the younger folks to come in and like, I don't know, experiment with stuff, which, <laughs> which sounds kind of, you know, it, it's neat. They're really neat and the kids that come in are really neat, so. I want to make sure we keep an eye on the evolving space needs. There's been a lot Absolutely. of libraries going through mm -hmm. converting storage space into usable human space that certainly is something that that we would not be opposed to um, I know one of the things that we struggle with sometimes when we have programs that are very popular is fitting everyone in the building and we start out thinking it's gonna be a crowd of 30 and next thing we know I think the largest we had was 87 don't tell the fire wow. marshal um, so they spread out around the building it was not all in one room um, 
So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for You're everything welcome. you and your team do. Thank you. They're, they really deserve all the credit. They're wonderful. Great. Thank you. Uh, Department of Community Development. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to address you tonight. I'm Abby Kenyon, the Director of Community Development. The Community Development Department is responsible for the administration of the town's overall land use and development. Specifically, we oversee all applications pending before Granby's land use boards and commissions. This includes the Planning and Zoning Commission, Inland Wetlands and Water Forces Commission, and Zoning Board of Appeals. This year is proving to be quite busy. Um, so far, the Planning and Zoning Commission has received 10 applications, which exceeds um, more than we received last year to date. And the Wetlands Commission has also been busy processing five applications to date this fiscal year, which again is um, more than the same time the last year. In addition to providing support to our land use boards, the staff, the department is also the staff liaison to the Development Commission and other boards and commissions as the need arises. Um, so this past year, we assisted with the Kearns Community Center Advisory Committee, which met 11 <coughs> times from January to June, and also the Plan of Conservation and Development Implementation Committee, which also met 11 times this past year. So while much time is spent administering the town's overall land use and development process, the department oversees a broad range of other projects and work. We provide GIS mapping services to the public and other town departments. We are responsible for the town's small cities housing rehabilitation program and will be heavily involved with any small cities grants we decide to pursue in the future, um, similar to those completed for Salmonbrook Housing and Stony Hill Village. We are also the main point of contact on several transportation projects, including the completed sidewalk project here in Granby Center, as well as DOT's two ongoing projects, including the roundabout and the Granby Center intersection improvement project. We also work closely with the Department of Public Works on our MS4 stormwater requirements, as well as our sanitary sewer standards. We are also the point of contact for the region's update to the hazard mitigation plan, and we are the liaison to FEMA as they study the Farmington River watershed and revise their flood risk maps. We also provide census data and other information to town departments and organizations when requested, and we fulfill a variety of other tasks um, as the need arise. So pretty much a catch-all. Um, I should have pointed out in the beginning, but we have a very um, dedicated team of staff that I work with. Um, Ann Windsor, administrative assistant, Bill Velofsky, our building official, Harold Holmes, our part-time fire marshal, Kevin Clark, our consultant engineer, Kate Bednaz, our wetlands agent, and Eric Vincent, our part-time emergency management director, who I'm sure you'll hear from later on. Um, so we're a small team, but we certainly accomplish a lot. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any members of the board have any questions? I was wondering, as you were saying we so many times, <coughs> that there's a number of part-time resources draw upon. Yes. Including your share time with Anne Marie with the building inspection. And there's actually yes. one full-time employee in the development uh, department that you're speaking of, and that's yourself. Is that correct? Correct. And everything else is pulled in as needed yes. for specific tasks. So thank you for marshalling all those resources under that umbrella. Thank you. And when you mentioned all those meetings, I. I think your name was every one of them. She said that so thank the you for that push during the year. Yep. Thank, thank you. you very much, Abby, for everything you and your team do. Thank you. Yeah, you. Know yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just want to say she was extremely helpful and useful on, during our, our much longer than we thought um, period of talking about the current school. So an invaluable resource. Great. Well, it's thank a you. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we will not be having Department of Town Clerk, because uh, she's out sick, but we will have Department of Collector of Revenue. Lauren Stuck. <laughs> Good evening. Um, my name is Lauren Stuck, and I am uh, Granby's Collector of Revenue. Being a tax collector is not a glamorous job. We don't have fun and interesting programs like the library does, or awesome adventures like, like Parks and Rec does. But without our work, other community services would not be possible. All town services, from police protection to road maintenance to education, they all depend on the work of our office. 
This very large responsibility is managed on a small budget by me, one part-time employee, and the occasional use of a floater. Assessors and collectors need to work closely and cooperatively, and we do. Without assessors, I wouldn't know what to collect. And without collectors, what would be the point of doing all that assessing, Sue? <laughs> so it's really important for our offices to work together, but it's also important that we keep our duties separated. These checks and balances are vital to the integrity of our work. All of our duties are governed by Connecticut statutes. We have to carefully follow all laws, keep abreast of legislative changes, while providing the best customer service possible to our taxpayers using the most cost-effective methods. With every grand list that the assessor completes, the collector is responsible for making sure that the files are in balance and the bills are printed and mailed to the correct parties. We apply address corrections based on information from the United States Postal Service and the Department of Motor Vehicles. We update any new owner information that's not already in the assessor file. We code all the real estate bills handled by lenders so that they will go to the appropriate banks. Volunteer firefighter and ambulance exemptions are entered and a multitude of other things that are fine-tuned before bills go to print. This year we issued almost 17,000 bills in June and another 1,800 or so will be sent in December with the supplemental motor vehicle list. Of course, our busiest months are July and January when installments are due. Every batch of work has to balance to the penny and the deposits are made to the bank daily. The volume of mail and walk-in payments is huge for such a small staff, but we have a good system worked out and we try to make each taxpayer's visit as pleasant as possible. We also encourage online payments. Please. <laughs> Last year we collected over $38 million in tax revenue, which equated to 99.3% of the adjusted levy and 102% of the budgeted tax revenue. In addition to taxes, my department processes and records funds from other town departments. Things like parks and recreation fees, youth program fees, senior program lunches and snack shack money from the park, fees collected at the transfer station, all of that money comes to my office. It is uh, categorized and counted and deposited. This is a task that is done by very few tax offices in towns our size, and it consumes a considerable amount of time every day. Last year, we deposited almost $4 million of money other than taxes to the general fund. When it's not July or January, our duties include ongoing collection of unpaid bills, monthly issuances of delinquent notices, letters, telephone calls, working with outside collection agencies, researching address corrections for returned mail, issuing refunds for overpaid accounts, answering questions about real estate for title searchers, doing monthly balances for the finance office, regular filing of electronic reports to DMV regarding unpaid bills and subsequent payments and filing and releasing tax liens. Each year, I review all unpaid accounts and prepare a suspense list of uncollectible accounts for the Board of Selectmen to review and approve. In early spring, I acquire water readings from Salmonbrook Water District and Quarian Water, and I prepare estimates for the Board of Selectmen, who then put on their WPCA hats, as you know, and set the sewer use rates at public hearing. The bills are printed and mailed in May and collected in June. All of this work, is accomplished by one of the smallest departments in the town. This fall, I conducted a survey of comparably sized towns in Connecticut to assess staffing resources available in their tax offices. And I'll hand this out to you if you don't mind passing that down. Of the 14 towns that responded, 16 were on my list, Granby came in dead last in the amount of money available to pay for staff other than the full-time collector. Only one of these towns was also responsible for collecting departmental revenue, and many do not collect sewer use or sewer assessments. My budget for staff cannot be reduced further, and it really should be increased. When even a modest raise for my valued certified part-timer effectively reduces the number of hours of help I get, 
My ability to remain open during lunch, sick days, or vacation days is impacted. It affects my ability to try new initiatives and will eventually affect the town's ability to maintain such high collection rates. I ask that you keep this in mind as you prepare for the upcoming budget season. It's been my pleasure to serve the town of Granby in this capacity for over 23 years. My assistant, Patricia Orr, has been with me for 12 years. We are both Granby residents, so we have skin in the game, as they say. And we want to make sure that the work we do is done well and in the best interest of our fellow citizens. Do you have any questions? For me? Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? No, thank you. What, okay. what percent uh, actually pay online? We've seen uh, an explosion over the past maybe six years, and I don't know if I have a percent on that, but it's really growing and growing. One of the difficulties with online payments is that it costs people to pay online. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, and that's just because we have to pay somebody to manage that for us. Uh, if you pay online using an ACH or EFT, the cost of the transaction is 95 cents, regardless of how many motor vehicles you're paying mm -hmm. or how many parcels of real estate. Uh, that's not unreasonable right. as I look at it. It's, you know, a stamp is almost that much. Um, and you have the assurance that it's paid because you can get a confirmation right away. People want to pay with credit cards, and credit cards are where the expense comes in, and that's a 2.95% fee uh, of your bill if you're using a credit card. So that's a hurdle. And the only way we can get those fees down um, is that the town would have to pay more up front to the credit card vendors. So it's you know a balancing act. Yeah. My budget would go up uh, whatever amount. They're going to charge me extra per month for the service for us to get a tenth of a point down in the rates. Do you think it's 10% that pay online or less? Oh, I think it's probably, yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know. It's, it's a few million dollars a year that we're okay. collecting credit cards right now. And, and is that something you could uh, collaborate with other towns? No. And negotiate with the credit card? No, it no. is not. It's a contract that is for each town. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Thanks. and we pay, we pay the, uh, we use Invoice Cloud. There are, um, credit card company and they do a really good job with towns and a lot of other agencies as well uh, but then our software tax software has to interface with them so there's another fee involved in that but there's um, you have to do it we need to have online payments mm -hmm, and right. it is a huge benefit to us staff wise the reason we don't take credit cards in the office seems a little counterintuitive people walk in and want to hand us a card but the reason we don't is because we are so short staffed and a credit card payment at the counter takes longer than a check or cash at the counter um, and we need to encourage people to use the online resources mm -hmm. uh, that's you know I, I kind of remain firm on that that we need to encourage people to use online t tax payments certainly if they need to come in to talk to someone in person by all means you're you know we, we welcome that mm -hmm. but in most cases people can pay online well i do know firsthand you do take our money with a smile yeah, we try. <laughs> we try. So that's, you know i'm, I'm thankful for and that. really it's a lovely town to work for and i wouldn't have stayed in a job like this with you know my background wasn't in accounting or anything like that so it's uh it's lovely to work in a town like this the people are very very good the citizens of Granby are wonderful very good. Thank if you I very can much. circle back just on one oh, thing, yeah, sure. which is you, you brought up, I remember last year's budgeting discussions and yeah. flex staffing and trying to keep the office open during yeah. periods where you, know, you need to take a lunch break, for instance, but that's when... Yeah, I can't, I, can't do, I can't leave my office. This year or this past cycle when you went through that, were you able to keep the office hours open to the extent you desired to? I never closed the office in July or January for a lunch break. Um, because I am able to, I have to have two people in there for a good portion of the day. And that might not be two people in all day, but uh, certainly to cover the lunch hour. Now, during the remaining months of the year, no, I can't leave. I, the office closes for a half hour most days. Yeah. Not most days, a number of days. I don't have enough money. That $20,000 that I have to pay for all of my staffing for a whole year does not cover that. Mm -hmm. You know, I still have to take vacation. <laughs> um, I don't have to, but I'd like to, and I don't want to lose any more hours than I already have on vacation time. And um, 
you know, we have to go to conferences every now and then and meetings occasionally. So it's an issue. It's certainly an issue. And the move towards online transactions doesn't reduce that burden enough to Not enough. free up those hours, particularly writing that correct. crux to the time period. That is correct. Yep. And if I may, I'd mm -hmm. like to take this opportunity to recognize and congratulate Lauren on December so it's second, I believe. Uh, the third, yeah. Third, she'll be recognized as a certified municipal officer by the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities, which means that she has taken courses in a wide spectrum of areas relevant to the administration of town hall. So I congratulate. Thank you. And she's the first one I know to be certified. And from Granby, yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, not the first one in the state. I think they had a class of maybe 15 last year, and I understand there are quite a few more this year who are being certified, so. No, Thank you for all your great <laughs> <and> congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Next, I'd like to have the, our tax assessor, uh, Sue L. Thierry, come up and present for assessment office. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, just so I can introduce myself to everyone, I'm Susan Altieri. I'm the assessor for the town of Granby. And I'm just going to go over some of the roles of the assessor's office and the responsibilities. First and foremost, we are governed all by state statute. So everything we do is by state statute. Um, we must be certified to complete our duties. Um, if we are not, the town can lose their funding, their education funding. And we have to continue with continuing education to continue to be certified. Some of the um, customers we serve are certainly the public, the citizens of Granby, certainly other town staff as far as boards, commissions. Um, we work with Lauren very closely and it's a great relationship. We're very fortunate for that. Um, also, attorneys that come into the office, certainly builders, real estate agents, appraisers, title searchers, it kind of goes on and on. And um, so mostly, you know, we are responsible for valuing everything in town. And, you know, one of the things is to be fair and equitable with everyone. And we discover, we list, and we value all the property in the town. So as Lauren alluded to, we can send out tax bills. Um, the other thing is... I think looking at last year's grand list, we were responsible for real estate. There's about 5,000 parcels, uh, personal properties. There's 400 um, businesses in town, and that also lease equipment to people in town, and also motor vehicles. There's over 12,000 motor vehicles that we value each year. Um, we are um, responsible for almost a billion dollars in valuations for all the properties in town. And um, also, we also value all the tax exempt properties. Real estate represents about 88% of our grand list with personal property about two and a half percent and commercial and industrial is probably about five or six percent. Just so you know, real estate, just to give you an example what real estate is, it's certainly the houses, the condominiums in town, the land, commercial and industrial properties, also public utilities that I think pe a lot of people don't think of. Public Act 490 is farm, forest, and open space, which allows a lower assessment on properties. And again, those are all governed by state statute. As far as tax-exempt property, there's over $65 million worth of tax-exempt properties. Those represent churches, the Granby Land Trust here in town, state and town-owned property, and the YMCA, certainly the schools. We're responsible for all the transfers in towns when I refer to transfers. It's everything that goes through the town clerk's office. We are responsible for recording all the deeds. Um, we update all the property owners. We track every sale and transfer. And also, as far as when we get to revaluation or just valuing properties, we also have to qualify a sale as it is valid or unqualify a, sa a sale. And that's every, again, transfer that comes through. Qualified sales are a typical arm's length transaction by a willing buyer and seller. Um, 
unqualified can be in a state, a distress sale, a foreclosure sale, different um, trusts. And uh, I laugh because sometimes looking at some of those deeds, I think I need a law degree to figure out some of them. Um, so we get all that from the town clerk's office. We track all the sales by sales price, styles, neighborhoods, construction costs, different trends that are going on in the market. Um, and as far as real estate also, as far as any subdivision in town, anytime there's a property, I'll just use an example, 34 acres or something like that, and it is divided into maybe 30 or 40 um, new houses or land, we must split those, we must account for those and value all of them. A good example is probably a lot of you know of the Copper Brook subdivision down off of Salmon Brook Street. That was one parcel of land. Now there's 34 properties there. Another good example is Murtha's Way with 130 apartments. All of those have to be valued, inspected, measured, enlisted. And we look at the cost approach. We also look at sales and income and expense statements for income producing properties. Um, some of the other things, um, also Greenway Village, that's another apartment. And uh, the, um, as far as good examples of personal property, that's all the businesses here in town. That's all the equipment that they own. As far as copiers, it can be computers, can be furniture and fixtures. The telecommunication properties, all the cell towers around town, we're responsible for valuing those cables, conduits that people don't even think about underground, underground with electric companies, the gas company, things like that. And uh, personal property, I think, is valued. I think the last year's gram list was plus or minus $30 million. And uh, last but not least, which represents about $95 million of our grand list, is motor vehicles. So every motor vehicle in town, which we have, Plus or minus about 12,000 vehicles every year. Those also have to be valued, and those are on average retail value. That would include cars, trucks, campers, snowmobiles, motorcycles. I think lots of things that you know you don't even think of. And then Lauren was also alluding to we also value about 1,800 uh, motor vehicles for the supplemental uh, motor vehicle list. We're also responsible, again, to the tax collector's office if there's any adjustment to an assessment. If someone sells a car, if a car is totaled, it's donated, registered out of state, the assessments have to be prorated and adjusted so, again, the tax collector can collect the proper amount for taxes. Um, many of you may have heard a few years ago a lot of problems with the Department of Motor Vehicles. We discovered and added many vehicles that I think people just unknowingly didn't know that, I don't know about anyone else, but I don't know to register my car unless I get a notice in the mail. And uh, motor vehicle, motor Department of Motor Vehicle was failing to tell people that. So we, our office discovered a lot of motor vehicles that got added because they weren't on the list. We're also responsible for exemptions. Some of the exemptions that people can receive our veterans exemption, uh, disabled, a blind. There's manufacturing exemptions. There's truck uh, commercial vehicle exemptions. Also the PA 490, Public Act 490. Active military can receive um, one vehicle exempt. And again, we have to keep track of those, all that. There's also an elderly homeowners program that we administer in the assessor's office. People 65 or older, depending on their income, can re get a reduction in their um, taxes. They have to file that annually. We are responsible for all those applications. And the town here also has a local option that they give to our elderly. And uh, so those are all administered in our office. Also, the Board of Assessment Appeals. We oversee, educate, and interpret state statutes for them. We teach them some appraisal practices. Anyone who may not be happy with their assessment has the opportunity to go to the Board of Assessment Appeals. They meet in March and also in September, and we are always there to help the Board of Assessment Appeals. Uh, 
Also, as far as, again, what trickles down to our office is tax collection, as far as assessments, the town clerk, as far as transfers, and every building permit that goes through the building department comes through our office, and we must go out and measure and list and value. Um, building permits could be new construction, new houses, new apartment buildings, um, additions, decks, barns, garages, lots of things, central air conditioning. So all those things trickle down to our office. The other thing is we are responsible for state reports that we must file with the state. So we ensure the town gets whatever money that they receive or can be reimbursed from the state, which as we've all seen is smaller and smaller every year. Um, we do a list of the top 10 taxpayers in town. Um, as far as anyone coming into our office, <coughs> phone calls, things like that. And then um, we too must keep abreast of any legislation that's going on and keep certainly John abreast of those and also how it may affect the town of Granby because it may affect every town a little differently. There's also every five years where the town is mandated to do a revaluation of every property in town. So we are responsible for that. That's probably a year and a half, two years addition to everything else we do. Um, and we do have help with that, but the assessor and the assessor's office oversees all of that. Again, we must meet appraisal standards certified by the state, all those uh, processes and procedures. The other thing is we keep the website updated if anyone ever needs to look up their assessment, their field card. Um, we have photos of every property in town on the assessor's card, their assessment. There's also forms and applications on our website, question and answer section regarding revaluation. We help keep up the GIS maps with Abby. And uh, the other thing is we're always with our customers and, and townspeople, you know, building trust, credibility, and relationships to the public and our customers. So you can always visit our website, give us a call, or stop by our office with any questions. And uh, that's it for now. I thought I had an hour, so I just <laughs> <laughs> Well, you did pretty good. Keep them up. Um, any questions from the board? Thank you. Susan, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank thank you. Thank thank you. Job, one comment, if I may. And Sue, first of all, thank you. But to follow up on what you said, I believe you said vehicles are 95 million or 98 million in the grand list. Plus or minus 95 million that they represent of our grand list. And I just want to point out to the board that there's still a movement in Hartford to eliminate the car tax, right. which would <coughs> remove that from our grand list. Yes. The state will reimburse us. Don't worry about yeah. it. Yeah. Checks in the mail. Right. Yeah. So, so who's more important, a collector or the assessor? <laughs> we work well together. That's a good answer. Without the assessor, you can't collect, man. Chicken and the egg's clear. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and just so those department heads know, you don't have to stay for the whole meeting. It was nice of you to come and present. We appreciate all the hard work. Uh, that you and your staff um, all put into uh, helping this great town of Granby. So thank you. At this point, we will move on to new business. John, any resignations? Uh, we do have one that is listed here under Parks and Recreation. Uh, Mr. Uh, let's see, uh, Sorry, you. Mancini retired from Parks and Rec. Do you have it? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. So I look for a motion to accept his resignation. With regrets. Approve the motion, yes, please. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Thank you very much for your service, Mr. Um, let's see. Moving on to appointments. Yeah. Give me a second. <laughs> um, appointments. Jim. Well, surprisingly, we have an appointment. Um, the Democratic Town Committee met, and um, I'll do this in two parts. The first part is the appointment to the vacancy on the Parks and Recreation, the remainder of the unexpired term of Severio Mancini, and is pleased to present for consideration the name Stephen Samard um, to be appointed to that remainder of term. Okay, that is a so motion. Moved. Is there a second? second. 
Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Extension motion carries. Thank you for your service. Thank you, Severio, and thank you even more, Stephen. Um, the second is a little bit more lengthy. Every year we uh, have uh, extra expiring terms on <coughs> different appointed boards. Common practice is we meet and bring forward those people who are willing to continue the service to the town or replacements uh, thereof. The town committee met and brings forward several names. I'll present them as a, a group. group, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, to the Conservation Commission, expiring terms of three people who have expressed a willingness to continue. Uh, move their continuance. Peter Jalbert, unaffiliated. David Desiderato, Democrat. And David Roberts, Democrat, for four-year terms. Second, on the Development Commission, an expiring term of uh, Matthew Brady and Dan O'Connell to, uh, re to uh, fulfill those. Uh, Matthew Brady, uh, continue. And to appoint <coughs> Monica Logan uh, to the second uh, term beginning January 14th. Those are two-year terms. Third on Inland Wetlands, John Ladotti's term is expiring, uh, and the committee uh, approves his continued service to the town of Granby. Uh, fourth, library board, uh, Audrey Lampert, uh, who took over an expired term uh, recently. Uh, her term expires in January. Uh, looking to continue, she offered the committee agreed with her continued service for a three-year term. And last on the Parks and Recreation Board, Stephen Smart just placed to appoint him to, uh, the, to the, uh, continuing term starting January 14th. That's five boards, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people. So moved, I can repeat it if needed. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? <clears throat> no. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, abstention, motion carries. Thank you, Jim. Mark? Uh, yes, for the opening on the School Projects Building Committee, uh, I'd like to move the name of Eric Brown, uh, a, uh, somebody with uh, additional bu building experience to assist the committee. Uh, he's in, uh, from uh, Thornbrook in West Granby. Great. Thank you. So that's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you to those folks for volunteering and for your service. Moving on to consideration of fiscal year 2020 repurpose of capital equipment improvement fund. John? Thank you. Uh, I'm looking for your assent to repurposing some of the capital <coughs> improvements money, specifically $10,000 from HVAC to um, pay for repairs at 11 North Granby Road, AKA the Drummer Building. It, along with many structures, sustained hailstorm damage. During the repair, it was learned that there was a issue with some of the underlying plywood, namely being rotted out. Uh, it made sense to address that at the time. Um, and so we did using the same contractor that was repairing the siding. Um, so we would like to utilize the money and the HVAC product project will be deferred to next fiscal year. Okay. I'll look to a motion to approve the repurposing of funds. We'll Some? make a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion? Just so I understand, John, there'll be additional line then inserted in that project and the HVAC would move out? Yes. Would it be a separate line? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, would that be all of the HVAC or just $10,000 value from current? Just the 10000 The original amount was 24000 So will there be any HVAC upgrades? Mr. Severance? I didn't hear. I'm sorry. Will there be any HVAC upgrades at all? Yes. In this fiscal? There's still a couple in the police department. In the police department. <laughs> okay. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? We have a second. Second vote. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion carries. Thank you. All right. Moving on to consideration of solar farm at Wells Road School. John? Thank you. Um, as requested at the last meeting, 
the uh, school or solar project building committee is making a report back to the board of selectmen as to the status of the project. And I see uh, Chairman Scoto is in the audience, and I believe is Stuart next to you? Mr. Stuart Browning, also from the solar building committee. Um, you have before you a written memorandum, but I'll try and, or I will go ahead and summarize it. Uh, since this project was approved by the voters back in June, further work has been done um, that affected the project. Namely, while the issue of wetlands was known uh, when this project was first being developed, which resulted in a 20% reduction of the size of the project as submitted to the pro, uh, voters, since then, um, the issue of vernal pools was investigated, which would be required for any regulatory approval. Uh, the short version is there were two uh, or several vernal pools discovered on the property, which resulted in requiring a significant decrease in the amount of panels. It was advised or the advice of both the attorney and the engineer that in order to get this through a regulatory approval, there would have to be approximately a 75 foot setback from the vernal pools. That basically reduced the amount of available panels from 4,500 to 1,500. So effectively a little over two thirds reduction in the scope of the project. Um, while that in turn lowers the construction cost, it also lowers the revenue anticipated. As you may recall, there's two streams of revenue that were to originate from this project. One is the renewable energy credits. In this case, they were the large renewable energy credits or the LREC. The Board of Education had entered into the state run auction for those and had a set price through a 15 year agreement with Eversource. In addition, the Board of Ed successfully applied for entrance into the virtual net metering program. What that would mean is that the electricity generated at this would go to offset the Board of Education um, bill, which ballpark they pay $400,000 a year for electricity. And there was also, while not revenue, this was subject to a reimbursement from the state of 39% of so approximately 500,000 off the construction cost. So the projection was for uh, between 3.1 and $4 million of revenue over 25 years. In light of the new factors, the anticipated revenue over 25 years is the best case scenario of approximately 900,000. So significantly lower, still a pretty large number. Um, the solar building committee wanted to bring that to the attention of the board of selectmen. Uh, there were other variables that entered into since um, this was traveling through CPAC and to the voters. And I just want to make a statement. It's not that the Board of Education didn't do anything to prepare this project. These are variables that have come to light as it's gone through the process. <coughs> and again, <clears throat> this project has always faced the chicken versus egg syndrome. They could sink two or three hundred thousand dollars of soft cost in it to perfect all these numbers. But if the voters had ultimately decided they weren't interested, then that money would have been lost. So, based on the information, or based on the information to date now, there's a good chance that this has to be approved by the Army Corps of Engineers because of the involvement of the wetlands. And the Solar Building Committee wanted to bring to the board's attention that that added an extra risk. <clears throat> One more attorney's fees to <clears throat> they have to come up with design fee uh, design as anticipated for the fields in a stormwater system but <clears throat> unlike the local wetlands army corps of engineer has no 
skin in the game, shall we say. So there isn't a sense that, you know, this thing is, there's no certainty as to that it would be approved per se. Um, so that was another risk involved with that. So because of, another factor is because of the reduced size of the project, a motion has to be filed with the Public Utilities Regulatory Agency, which is the state agency, PURA, to extend the timeline. The original agreement called for a substantial completion by October of 2019 <clears throat> with energizing by April 2020. That won't happen now. Best case scenario is probably December 2020, maybe as far back as April 2021. If the time frame is not modified by motion through PURA, we'd lose one year of LREX revenue, which would be approximately $33,000. Now, <clears throat> PURA has approved similar requests in the past, but that's no guarantee that they would approve this one. <clears throat> also, because of the smaller scope, the rate that virtual metering pays may be altered as well. That's not known at this time. So, you have a a smaller project, you have more risk than initially anticipated. Now, this board has several options, and I conferred with bond council on this. You have the authority to um, authorize the project to continue as presented. You have the authority to stop the project. Um, or, you don't, and you don't have to take any action tonight. The project is at the point where, if it's going to move forward, sums have to be invested. Eversource wants their connection fee of $40,000 sooner rather than later. Though they have been working with us and they've been patient. But <clears throat> we'll have to pay the attorney, pay the engineer in order to get it before the regulatory boards. If it's <clears throat> downsized, it won't have to go to the siting council. <clears throat> It'll go to the local board. I ran through quite a bit. So, any questions? <laughs> Gee. <laughs> <laughs> One quick question: How yes. much? How much have we invested in this project already? Thank you. <clears throat> Townside, approximately seven thousand total spent. Eighty thousand. And I want to thank the school business manager, Anna Robbins, for <clears throat> all the assistance and the fact that she's done 90% of the work. I thank her, but she's been <clears throat> invaluable to the committee. John, I thought, I thought the number that was tossed around that's already been invested was closer to 200. That's the number if I said that, <coughs> then I was wrong. Okay, because that's the number that we talked about in the last several meetings. That might have incorporated what the connection fee at the time we thought we had to pay and at full size is closer to 80000 So that might have been rolled into, thank you. So our the cost so far is only how much? 87, 87, the Board of Ed spent 74000 the town 7000 Okay. And that money is um, is my understanding correct that if this project is eventually, if this is a project, which is a question of itself, right, I think, of meeting bond criteria, that money would be bonded rather than through, go through operating budgets? Anything we expend uh, in the next few months can be used through the bond process. Some of the expenditures going back to 2017 cannot. But the money only could be spent if there is actually a project. If the project is halted, is it still possible to spend our, to absorb our upfront monies into making that determination through the bond? I don't know. If it was spent after the bond was a project was approved in good faith, because the the project was approved and going forward, the fact that the project was canceled, I don't think would retroactively nullify the uh, 
approval to spend those sums. That, that's I'm, not a question I've run by bond council. Yeah. I'm not sure of the determination of that, but in making the decision, it would be important to know the consequence there. Um, I think we started all this with the very clear intent that we were going to look very hard at the size and what we ended up with, and this is our worst nightmare. Can I ask? I, I really. Yeah. Certainly. Um, ask if we would like to make some comments. Go ahead. Are you done? No. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think looking at the size and what we're ending up with and the revenue stream and all the other factors and all the approvals that we're now facing. It sounds like we're really getting a lot of a lot of tendency to say it's time to pull the plug. Well, it's not just in my worst nightmare would be the project went negative. It still has a million dollar net po or nine hundred thousand net positive in twenty five years, which is greatly diminished from what it originally was. So it's not the worst nightmare, it's, but it's getting very gray. It's getting very it? close. Yes. yes, and and I think one the other thing I'd like to make sure is on the table when we're considering a decision is that statements were made to the public, which I, I, have, I make an assumption that there's some of that in public record, and I'd want to make sure we have that language in front of us, whatever was stated to the public. Well, I think all the, uh, you can go back and look at the, the, Correct. the, 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 the meetings that we had on the bond, and you can, right. you know, I, I, certain I, people I, saying certain things would be the same. <coughs> I want to make sure that be. that's finally put forward to that us to recall because everybody's memory no, would be No, that question different. was asked and answered many times. Right. What was the wording of the answer? The answer was, if it didn't make sense, we weren't going to do it, and that meant Correct. that it had to be I don't know what sense means, so I'd want to make sure that language is presented well, to the board the, to consider. The other thing, too, though, Jim, is this is 900000 today. Time value of money for 25 years, that is not 900000 Uh I assume that's today's dollars, is that correct? Yeah. But what okay. I'm saying is, right. you know, time understand. value understand of money, that's I understand that well. not going to be worth that. What, I'd, yeah. I'd like to ask the committee members if, if you have anything to add. I mean, you guys did a lot of work. I'd like to be able to hear from some of your thoughts, input. It, before they speak, I just want to thank them as well. I mean, they've dived into this and they've worked their tails off <clears throat> and the results should not reflect the effort that they've put in. They're an excellent well, definitely, committee. Definitely. So if, if you guys wouldn't mind coming up, I don't mean to put you on the spot. If you have nothing, that's fine too. But. If for the record you could just state your name, and just so we have it. I say state your name. Yeah, that's it. Uh, <laughs> state your name. <laughs> I'm uh, Jameson Scott. I'm the chairman of the committee, and this is. Uh, I'm Stu Browning. I'm uh, on the committee, supporting James. Um, so based on what we've done up to this point, the what we're presenting today essentially is a nexus point where we have to make some decisions. The regulatory approvals that we're talking about, there's not. It's, they're not a, a huge negative expectation. There's precedent with these regulatory bodies that they would approve a project like this. They cannot give us any kind of indication whether or not they would approve the project or not without right. us spending some money for design and legal fees, which as John uh, mentioned earlier. Yeah. And that goes back to the chicken and the egg uh, issue, is that we can't get information from them about whether or not we get approval until we spend money on the design. We don't want to spend design, money on design right. until we know some idea if we're going to get any approval. Right. But looking at previous projects that we've talked about, the um, idea of getting approval does not seem out of the scope of possibility. Right. It's just that we can't get any indication of a yes or a no from them until we present something. Okay. So it's not that it's likely to get a no, it's just that it's you just don't know. They can't tell us, but based on previous projects that have been done throughout the state with wetlands and things like that, we think there's a reasonable expectation that it would say yes, we just can't get a firm answer. Is that, would you agree with that? So if, if I, I understand, oh, I'm sorry. I just want to add that it, one of the risks is that it's approved with adjustments. Okay. And so that affects scope and possibly, again, some of the payments that we receive. So that's why there was a lot, there are a number of unknowns here that are part of that risk. Just if I, excuse me, if I may add, 
another risk that I didn't articulate is the 39% reimbursement. The state approved the big project. Right. We don't have any affirmation from them that they would approve the smaller project. And if they did, it wouldn't be 39%? Um, the, the, the I would assume it'd be 39, it could be lower, but the bigger risk is that it's zero. And that's about a $500,000 risk. So the well, approvals were a percentage for. based on the size of the project. So right. at the original size of the project, it was $500,000. At the current size, it's much reduced. However, the board grant, which I think we're talking about, also was uh, the reason they were enthusiastic about giving us such a, a good grant, was because this is the first time that any project is doing a virtual net metering project. Okay. So there's been solar projects in the past done at other school systems that were all on site and paying for that one school. Mm -hmm. The state seemed motivated to give us money because we're now incorporating a larger system to offset money for the entire school system. So they may reduce the amount of money, but I don't, in terms of the dollar amount, because the project is reduced in size, we don't know if it's gonna be a percentage reduction off of what they've already told us. We think that they would still approve it. Again, this is our reading, right. between, reading the tea leaves, okay. but because of their motivation, we thought it was a reasonable thing to expect some money from them still. Now, is that, what, John, what, I'm sorry, is that, that right? is that how you recollect the um, state? Or sorry, was that Anna? No, I was mean, that, my understanding was, sorry, was we don't have any tea leaves from them as far as the reduced. <laughs> right, that, right. So, and I refer to Mrs. Robbins, who has much more expertise with interpreting the department's tea leaves, but Right, right now, we don't have any assurance. It's still the 39%, but it would be for the reduced project if they went ahead and said yes, which is the tea leaf part. So the approvals we still kind of need are are that. the Is that the LREX? No. No, so the LREX, right, to see what those are. Mm -hmm. And also the third is Army Corps of Engineers. In virtual net metering. So four. Okay. Right. That's a lot of approvals. So and how much do we have to ones. spend to get those approvals? 40000 for the hookup fee with Eversource, uh, 35000 design fees and attorney's fees to get through Pura uh, and the wetlands, and probably more to get through the Army Corps of Engineers. So none of those were contemplated in the original numbers, correct? So does that come off the 900,000? No, that's all contemplated in the original numbers. Right. But we didn't know about Army Corps of Engineers, did we? No. The Army Corps needs the design and the legal documents as well. There's no cost so for it's, approval. It's the same, as far as we know, the, the cost. Anna, do you anything about the yes, cost of approval? <clears throat> it's the same documents to use for, oh, for those approvals. There are some, some application fees, but overall, with a contingency, that those costs were covered in the, in the So this 939-241 is pretty solid. We may, go, we may go from 939 down to 902 or 9, because we may lose a year of the LREX, depending on timing. The other issue with this project is uh, we were supposed to energize in April. We're hoping to get an extension. If we don't, we could lose one year's worth of LREX, which would be 30 something thousand, thus bringing the project down to the 900,000 John mentioned in his, in his initial speech. Okay. But, but it seems like there's three, three inputs into the model that we're missing. Well, four. One of them is size, because we're still not sure of the size, but more important than net metering, what they're going to pay us, what we're going to get for LREX, right? These were all designed and or the, so and then had, what we're going to get for reimbursements. So the model is based on the original size. It's based on the original size, okay. and now that we've had to do a reduction, so those those three the inputs, the variables, right. I would call those variable inputs. We don't know what they are. We have a proposed hybrid plan that we think that the engineers gave us that is a bare bones thing that uh, bare bones plan they give us to work with which i think was incorporated right. with right. Them right. no no but that's but that includes um what they believe are actual 
That's based on the best information we had at this point. Okay, so it does not include new figures for either LREC or virtual. And that's what I'm asking. Nor does it include. So, so those it includes the 39% grant reimbursement. Those three variables. Yeah, right. 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 So the, okay. And that's where it comes down to spending some money at this point to get some design to go ahead and try and eliminate those variables. The, the other thing, um, when I read the memo, <clears throat> and maybe it was crafted this way, but there's no recommendation from the committee. Yeah. <laughs> is that correct? That's correct. And that was purposeful. Okay. Because some, of this, is, sure some of this is a policy issue. Right. It's not a issue of can we get this done. The committee, if I may say, was respectful of the jurisdiction of the Board of Selectmen okay. and didn't want to step on your jurisdiction uh, yep. toes. No, that's greatly appreciated. I bet you guys learn more about solar than you ever wanted to know, right? Holy cow. I think it's less about solar and more about the law and contracts. Yeah. Well, Jeez. It's amazing work you guys did. I just, you know, you hear that it's a third of the size. I just... So what do so, what do yeah what, what do we need what do we do need to do this? right and what more information do we need name the three them? options again if you could uh, well Jim, you Trump. could wait let Jim sorry okay I, Jim. I, I thought you said in the beginning we don't need to do anything if we do nothing that's we'll proceed that's to the I next natural steps for the options right well, so is that right that's or options. you could affirm the project. Or you could, for example, table it to a future meeting and have the public address it through the uh, public session. You could call for a public hearing if you want to solicit input from the public. Um, so in essence, you, you have the authority to end the project if you wish by yourself. The board has that inherent authority. So you can solicit more information. You can solicit public input. You can do nothing. Or you can uh, move to uh, terminate the project. And do you want to close that? Yeah, I'd like to. So <clears throat> I, I guess my view at this time was, since, since I was actually the only <clears throat> member of this board to vote against it, not because of the solar, but because I believe it impedes on people's property rights and totally devalues their property. And, and that was when this was buttoned right up against them, their properties. But we did go to the town. Uh, the town approved a certain project with certain, you know, a view of what this was going to do for the town, what it was going to do for the schools, et cetera. And I guess at this point, I think we need to go back to the public and hold some public information sessions and some and some public hearings to, to hear what the, the public wants us to do before we spend any more money. Um, and, and I guess I'm still also stuck on the $200,000 that I thought was already spent, and now it's 70. But it, if that's the actual number, that's a lot better than 200. But I think we should clarify that number. But I think we need to go back to the public. God, Ed, I have to say, I agree. Wow. No. Mark Start of a new term. Uh, there you go. <laughs> no, no, no. I, but I have the same concerns that, that I thought there was a higher number right. for, for the input, and that I, I think that it is uh, we, the public was told what we were hoping, and now we have the, the more apparent reality. And yeah. There has to be a discussion about whether or not we want to go forward. And I don't. I think you're right. I don't think that's a decision we should just make on our own. Yeah. We want some input. I fully agree. I don't but want we it. We thank you guys for coming back to us the way you have because yeah, I think you. you understood our concerns. I don't want beginning. it to sound like a, not a bait and switch, but like everybody said, this is what we presented. This is what we voted for and it is substantially smaller now. And we don't have all the approvals we need to go forward. I, I'm just not comfortable with that. But that's my feeling. I'd like to ask, from um, you, well, I'm always in favor of more information. And yes, I think this is a significant change to what the public voted for in the 
uh, bond issue. But I'd like to know is, um, do we need to still adhere to some kind of schedule to make the project worthwhile? Because one of the risks is not getting the LREC extension or not getting the per approval. And if we, uh, while gathering more information is important, if that takes too long, does that negatively impact our chances down right. the road? Right. If, and if we wanted to preserve the project even at this reduced size, do we need to continue moving forward while we gather more information? That is one of the concerns of the committee that we, we wanted to ask the board, which is this is a very time sensitive issue. And if we can do anything to expedite the process of public hearings, that would be greatly appreciated. When could we have a public hearing if we were to have one? Either your first or second meeting in December. I would suggest that the decision be made before the end of the year. But I think if we extend it into January, yeah. no. we are going we to be running a follow of deadlines. That is, that's correct. Um, did the committee contemplate that at all in terms of what a public hearing would do? We, we discussed it a little bit, and yeah. we know that it's going to it. The more we delay, the more it's going to impact our ability to collect the LREX because we're going to delay energizing the project if yeah. we go forward. And if we delay collecting, uh, energizing the project, we lose some of the LREX because we're not producing for Yeah, but there's source. just so many variables. I'm not arguing that. I'm yeah. just letting you know that, that, was our, yeah, yeah. that was our concern with the only yeah. hesitation with the public hearing. We thought, we thought it might go to a public hearing yeah. just to get input again. And that's why we're asking just to be expert. Just and to please try note, this, yeah. this is yeah. not a reflection on, we appreciate so much right. all the work. I, I know you guys met, I've been to a couple, but you guys, it, it was amazing. All the information you had, all the, the knowledge you gained, and we, you know, are very thankful for what you did. Um, anybody else, Jim? So just clarity on some of the time phasing. I, a lot of my career is in engineering project management. Oh, I'm picturing those charts and yeah. getting scared. Um, but they give you a lot of knowledge. Um, so my visualization, John, was that there was a, a, a thirty or forty thousand dollar additional spend to get a, a certain stage, and then design engineering of another hundred or maybe the hundred included that. But is there anything critically time sensitive within the thirty day window on that? Thirty-five or forty thousand dollar piece that would preserve the opportunity, or can that be deferred outside the thirty-day window? One of the deadlines we have coming up is, and correct me if I'm wrong, is EverSource wants us to sign a new interconnection agreement, and we've held them off for a few more months. But they want some type of certainty in early spring because if we're not going to use the money, they want to use it elsewhere. Uh, we have to file a motion with Pura. I'm not aware that we're under any deadline that has to be by December 15th or anything of that. But overall, the longer we wait, the more likely we'll miss a construction season or we'll get bogged down by one of the regulatory agencies. So some of this is still terror incognito. So we're mapping our way through the best as we can. So if we move to cease spending subject to a public hearing and decision, is that what that's that sounds like what I'm hearing? I, I, but I, I want to make sure that that's not causing a greater or that we understand the, the risk that's associated with that. Yeah, there's there's just some risks of lost revenue the longer we wait, and that's why again I don't I don't think the public hearing is a bad idea. I just think again if whatever we can do to expedite it would be helpful to the board and the committee. Okay, I think that answers it. Thank you. I mean, we could have it the first meeting of December, and then you yes. have a vote by the second meeting. Right. You know, to give us time to get us to public January input first, yeah. for people writing in, and us to kind of absorb some of that. So. Have them suspend till January 1. Well, so like one of the things that you know <clears throat> people talk about is communication, right? So having one meeting after Thanksgiving, you know, I'm not sure that's enough notice, to be honest with you. I mean, this is this was a big project. A lot of people attended those sessions. We had them 
during the day, we had them in the evening, we had them at different times. Right. So I want to make sure that we're not part of the shortchanging the public who voted on this project. Yeah, it's I, a public I, hearing, though. It's not yeah, a But you could have a comment open and publicize I think it. What I'm saying we need a public information session to say that this project is downsized to by two thirds. That's that's what I think. Well, we well, should do a public, public hearing, hearing for that. Because public hearing allows feedback. Right. I, one possibility would be to have the public hearing not at the first meeting in December, but the second. I don't think the two weeks will make or break All right, the project. I was just going to start with the. Um, hmm. But that, then I would encourage either resolution that night or certainly no later than the first meeting in January. Okay. Um, and, and, and again, that would give us a little more time to publicize it. The public information meeting would basically just be a replication of what we just had here tonight, um, informing the public of the new, the latest facts. Will this be on the town website? Yeah, I mean, certainly I can put it on. Because I, that's... Your memo is very comprehensive, yes. Thank you for the John. <laughs> and to Anna and to oh, Anna. I should call that quickly the drummer's going to print. Drummer is going to print this or the timing of the drummer might be something to consider, John, making it widely mm -hmm. known. Public meeting. Right. Public meeting. Public information meeting. So does that make sense yes. of a yes. public yes. hearing the second meeting of December? Right. Get everybody is, so they can hear the same. And that gives enough time who, would you think who can who can give the presentation on where we are i mean that's difficult it would be the committee yeah uh, along with staff uh, mrs robbins myself mrs kenyon so it'd be the 16th of december is the, so that's basically that's the a second. month that's the second one that's no the, the second third meeting december yeah the second meeting the second yeah. meeting so the third oh. meeting december 1st is I thought we were going to have a, the, a, pu a public uh, meeting. We were going to have an information meeting. Or, I mean, an open a session. A public hearing pu public on the sixteenth. On the sixteenth, but but the first meeting of the month, we're going to have a information so people can. That makes sense. Yeah. Right. Well, That's what you said. That's what I thought we were going to have it on the sixteenth. We are going to have the public hearing, hearing. on the sixteenth. But so information. we're going to repeat this three well, meetings in a row. No. Why not we could do more one? information for the folks who either aren't here or aren't watching or don't look at the website. It, it just it, yeah. maybe you could do it in your yeah. section, and then for the public hearing, we have the committee come back. Okay. I, you can never give too much information. But who's going to? But but the first meeting in December, if you had that open on this topic. Who's going to make a presentation about it? It's not really a presentation. It's reading. Well, the town manager. But, but if could people do come that. in that haven't heard any of this tonight, they're not going. They're, they're not. I mean, this is not exactly easy to digest no. if you haven't heard anything about it before. If these are people that were here during the bonding um, meetings back in the spring. Mm -hmm. They're not going to remember anything. So you've what got to. You, you I'm saying that somebody's got to lead them through it. Would you like this on as an agenda item on the next meeting? Yeah. during which it, we could discuss it and then it will be on as a public hearing on the 16th which would also incorporate a formal presentation to the audience at that time and then give the audience a chance to speak up as yeah, well we, we want the feedback okay so we'll do it as an agenda item the next meeting and we'll do it as a presentation with the public hearing on the 16th does that incorporate what the board wishes the only problem I'm having is the, the people you still are going to have, if the public hearing is the second meeting and they haven't come to the first meeting, but now they hear about it, they're not going to have any, any session where they're going to hear the facts as they were. The only thing is we have a month to... I, I get it. We, I get don't it have, we don't have a month. I mean, we, we were pushed here quick to have this done, and obviously not enough research was done up front. Right? Well, I mean, so I think we got to think this through and make a very informed decision. And that includes the public's input and in, in informing the public what's going on. Because there, there was a lot. 
certainly in, in the bond presentations, when many of which I went to, and I'm sure many of you went to, there, there was that, um, it was always said that we weren't sure about the wetlands, we weren't sure about the size, and mm -hmm. things could change. But, um, you know, here we are, and now that's what's happened. But right. people aren't going to remember it as clearly as we did, certainly. But well, it's, it's great to make statements, folks, but what are your suggestions? My suggestion is we have a public information session. When? At least one. When? Let's have it in the uh, second week in December. But and before the this, before the third, before the second meeting, where we're going to have the public hearing. Well, you're okay. saying push back the public hearing yeah. to January. No, we can't do that. All right, go have it in. We'll do it. But that's why I'm saying do something in the first meeting in December. So at least the information, the, the factual information that we have is disseminated then, so people can be more up on it and be there for the second meeting, which is going to be the public hearing. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm trying to say. Gee, can I say that? Yeah, I, that's no, okay. But, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm thinking through a little bit of the communication schedule because our vehicles in town are E or paper, and the paper one is timely, such as there's a monthly newspaper that comes out the first of the month, let's say. So. We want to have our plan, you know, the presidents have plan spelled out there. <coughs> if not all the supporting detail on who, it occurs to me that possibly the first meeting could be by the committee on information and could be in that fifth to tenth window, followed, by, you know, with a followed up within a week or so by a public hearing, which involves the board <coughs> and the rest. Um, and then we have a meeting following that where we can make a decision. It seems to me that there's three steps I'm hearing, informing, getting input, and then making a decision. And, and we want to have those three laid together we can make and it. announce pretty quickly. And so the timing of those, you may not all be able to answer right here, but that would be my intent, that we step it out and know what we're, you know, make a commitment to the public. So, John, let me ask this. If we do the information session the 2nd, the public hearing the 16th, and then our first meeting in January is the 6th, we could make our, have our discussion and decision <coughs> then. My concern is what does that do with pushing this project and costing us more money and then finding out certain folks don't approve it? meaning uh, regulatory agencies. We're not going to know whether or not the regulatory agencies approve it until sometime After in 2020. Okay. I, mean, I don't expect we're going to have much more information in the next six weeks than we have now. Okay. Again, that reverts back to the original problem of do you want to invest the money to have more precise figures? Um, I think Focusing just on the magnitude of the change, I mean, these numbers are certainly in the ballpark. Um, but getting back to your point, January 6th, I don't think is going to be, I'm not aware that it's going to trigger any immediate problems. It's, it's just the longer we wait to fish or cut bait, the more the chances we're going to run into some deadline issues. I'm not aware that the clock is ticking on when we have to follow, follow, file with Pura. But again, the longer we wait to start, the more likely it is we'll miss a construction season or we'll have further problems that will delay. Eversource is looking, Mrs. Robbins, correct me, they want us to sign a new agreement and pay them by, I think, around March. And so I, I would assume that most of this activity will take place if this gets approved February, March. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll move forward with the project. We will ask Pura to not take away the LREX. I don't know whether or not they're inclined to do that or not. Mm -hmm. So um, LREX 33,000 divided by 12 is 3,000 a month. So delaying this will probably, worst case scenario, minimum 4,500. So I mean, I think we're all in agreement. We want as much public input as we can get. So, so Scott, if I move, sure. If I move to schedule two presentations, 
subject to John finding the dates that result in uh, information coming back from the public, information being presented, public feedback being given, public and leading hearing. to a Board of Selectmen meeting with it on the agenda to for consideration no later than January 6th. That's our first and meeting. And if it could be that you find a, a valid schedule to do that at the mid-December meeting, that's fine, but no later than so January 6th. Let me just clarify. Yeah. This first meeting is an no? information session. Second I'm, I'm, meeting, we've got to be official here. Right. The second meeting is a public hearing. And then our third meeting is a regular meeting okay. with an agenda item for our That uh, captures final. the intent of my motion. On January. Yeah. Thank so we're talking you. January first, first meeting January in six, six, was it? Correct. First meeting in December, <clears throat> information session for anyone who wants to attend. Second mm -hmm. meeting, public hearing, decision January 6th. Correct. Okay. Is it your wish to, to have the that? informational meeting as part of the Board of Selectmen meeting on December 2nd? I'd let you, I'd let you call that shot, John. Okay. Yeah. So Look we, at the schedules closely. So we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion? No. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Really Thank appreciate you all. It. Appreciate, the, appreciate the work. Good. Well, that was fun. All right, tell, us, tell, tell managers report. Okay, budget operations for the month of October. Um, okay. As you heard tonight, our collector revenue is doing a fantastic job, and our collections are at 57%. So we're ahead of the halfway mark. Uh, in regards to other revenue from the state, we've received the first payment of ECS money on schedule, 13 or 1.3 million. So we have another 75% to be paid out through the rest of the year. Um, most of the state payments are still trickling in and um, Outside of ECS, we haven't received them. Town revenue is on schedule. Uh, we still have some excess money coming in on building, building permits and in inlands, believe it or not, still due to the, due to the hail storm damage. Um, otherwise, revenue is coming in as expected. In regards to town expenditures, the expenditures are also on target as well. Folks, if I could have you either step out or because you're on camera and it's not appropriate. Okay. Um, you have my written report as well. Um, included in that is an activity report on the other or on the bond projects. The bridge building committee met tonight and several of the gentlemen are here in the audience. Um, they are proceeding very well on right now the design agreements for Moosehorn, Donahue, and Simsbury have been executed after your approval of them and they've been, they have been forwarded to the state. The committee was working tonight on finalizing the request for proposals for design services on Griffin and Hungary with the thought process being we'll solicit design work for them at simultaneous. And just to remind you, the bridges fall into two different categories. Moosehorn, Donahue, and Simsbury are all under the federal program, and the state is handling the design work for those. Griffin and Hungary, they're not. That's up to the town to solicit. Um, don't think you need to hear about the solar project. <laughs> um, school projects are also advancing well. Um, as I indicated in the written report, the projects were received a preliminary prioritization list by the committee. There, the subsequent meeting was a tour of the high school where the committee could look at the uh, areas that were to be changed. Um, right now, the roof on the middle school 
building is a quote for being solicited for an architect. The state requires an architect, even though the job is relatively small. And not to be too confusing, the majority of the roof at the middle school was being repaired pursuant to the hailstorm insurance claim. This portion was not affected by the hailstorm claim. Uh, the committee is meeting tomorrow, and what will be discussed will be an RFP for architectural services for all the other high school <coughs> projects. Um, because certainly they, they will need architectural work. Uh, let's see. And costs at library, it's not bonded through the referendum. But as Ms. McHugh indicated, uh, there is funding from the Hartford Foundation, and they're, they've issued an RFQ for architectural services. There was a very successful mandatory walkthrough. Ten different firms attended. I believe the proposals are due in by the end of the month. Holcomb Farm, the roof work was completed, uh, and the drummer building, as you've heard from another <coughs> member, was also completed. So thank you, Mr. Severance, for taking care of those projects. And also uh, thank you to Mr. Cassano, Mr. Boardman, for being on those committees because uh, I personally know you both have a lot of experience in that field, so it's good to have people uh, who have the experience. We're delighted to have you both on that committee, so thank you. And I second that. The board did an excellent job finding individuals on the building committees that are knowledgeable. Uh, we also have on the bridge committee, Mr. Demchuk, mm -hmm. uh, who was kind enough to review our RFP for insurance purposes. Okay. So we have tremendous amount of expertise on all the committees. Um, with regret, I'll make the next announcement. This week, we're gonna lose two pillars of the finance department. Um, Mrs. Susan Christian is leaving us after approximately two decades of dedicated service, as exemplified by the fact that she's here tonight in her last week filling in, taking notes. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've seen her here on the weekends doing minutes and doing other work. And it will also see the departure of our finance officer, Mrs. Shabelli, who with almost four decades dedicated to the town um, while I'm very pleased with the people we have coming in, it's still a very scary hit. We're losing two excellent workers, and I can't quantify the amount of knowledge that's going out the door. So I thank you very much. Um, we know where they live. Yes, we know where you live. And at least our assessor does it. <laughs> and both have volunteered to always to help out coming forward. Very nice. And I do have to thank Mrs. Shabelli, who foolishly originally thought she'd be leaving in July, <laughs> and has agreed to give us many job. more months uh, to help with the transition. So I truly appreciate all of that. That's my report. Any, Any questions? Yeah. Anything on uh, Kern's job? <clears throat> yes. Um, and actually, that was on the agenda for today, but uh, I pulled it. Um, we did. We are investigating another option, um, and it's not fully developed yet. I anticipate filling you in at the next meeting to see if there is a private entity that might be interested in exploring. Uh, providing educational services there. And I'm trying to think what else with that. And that's about it. Okay. All right. Any questions? Other questions from the family members? Moving on. Uh, first selectman report. I want to congratulate everybody who uh, won elections and, and campaigned and worked hard and volunteered. Uh, and helped at the polls. We had a great turnout. Uh, a lot of folks came out, and I know we got there at 5 a.m. to set up our little booth, and it's very cold at 5 a.m. in this wonderful town of Granby, but it, it was fun. Um, I also want to uh, just say a few words. Um, 
we this is the last meeting of selectman Lofink, and i just want to say that uh it has been my honor to work with you sir uh you volunteer for pretty much everything for the town of granby um <laughs> your name's everywhere uh you do a lot uh you have this town in the center of your heart right next to your wife so that's a, a good thing um and it, truly it's it's been my honor to work with you sir so um that's that's it so thank you jim thank you scott i also want to announce that uh december 2nd at our next meeting we will be having a ceremony for uh selectman low fink at 6 45 prior to our 7 p.m. meeting uh, to thank Jim and his lovely wife for their service and dedication and especially for uh, Cecilia um, having uh, or Celia having to uh, put up with Jim coming home after some long nights and and a lot of meetings so uh, we thank her as well for I would have to say her patience uh, and service as well so please join us if you can uh, at uh, December 2nd at 6.45, right here uh, in our little chambers here, we'll be celebrating uh, our friend Jim Lofink. Uh, that's all I have for first selectman report. Any members of the Board of Selectmen have anything to say? Yeah. No. Oh, I have my uh, oh yes, my school God. report. I haven't gotten to you yet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I need to jump the gun. Um, so I'll try to keep this short because I know it's kind of late. Um, so pretty much, biggest thing happening in the schools right now is our new superintendent has been appointed. Uh, Dr. Jordan Grossman will start at the beginning of the new year on January first. So we're very excited about that. Um, we recent, recently held the turkey trot at the high school, National Honor Society uh, ran that and we raised $740 for local families that cannot afford Thanksgiving meals and that was a really amazing fundraiser that we did. Um, moving on a little bit, uh, for athletics, right now girls soccer and field hockey are both advancing to semifinals in the state championship and we're hoping to get yeah. some state champs this year. Yeah, right. That's it. All right. Anyone else? for a motion to adjourn. Jim, do you want to make a motion to adjourn? I make a motion to adjourn. All right, is there a second? Second. second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, abstention, motion carries. Thank you, folks. Good night.